it's a well-known fact that different disciplines are supporting us in making different decisions during our day. Right? You won't come very close to the tiger in the zoo because the biology says it's a predator, it might bite you. You also somehow feel the force with which you need to throw the stone in order to reach the other bank of the river from the physics. Right? The modern medicine would be hardly possible without chemistry. And what about statistics? How does the statistics supporting our intuition? Formally, statistics is a part of mathematics. Right? And if you look more deeper, it's a part of the probability theory. It's a science which is linking beautiful and the very complex mathematical formulas with the beautiful and the very complex real world full of data and observations. And actually, all of us have some internal statisticians inside. Right? You, if you have a chance, you would barely go shopping on Saturday because you know it will be crowded there anyhow. So you better use Thursday or Tuesday. Also, you won't take tank up your car early morning or in the evening because the prices are higher. You better use the time during the day if you have a chance. And even statistically, while kissing, we are bending our head to the right in most cases. And in the heterosexual couples, males are in more cases initiating kisses. Right? Let me bring you to the small journey with the statistics over one day. Okay? So imagine it's early morning, Saturday, I just had my morning coffee, kids still sleeping, wife is sleeping, so we are planning our vacations. What is the most important in the vacation? It's the weather, right? So what you do, you first open the website, you check out the weather for the coming one or two weeks. That's actually what I did two weeks ago on the 16th of August, right? I opened the Vetacom. They are actually using a variety of different underlying models there. Statistical models, machine learning models, meteorological models. Then they are very nicely brought up together and delivered us as the forecast with this nice picture. Right? We have a band, lower band of this band is telling us the forecasted temperature over the night for the coming two weeks, and the upper band is telling us the forecasted temperature during the day. Right? It's obviously, it started decreasing because autumn is coming, winter is coming, but it's not the only website you check out, right? There is a lot of them, and I did the same, so I checked the weather online. <laughs> right, we see that actually short-term forecasts, they're pretty precise, they are dancing both together, but the farther it goes into the future, they're going apart. It doesn't mean that they are wrong. They're using different models, but all the predictions and the statistics, they're all working with the probabilities. Right? Nowadays, we see that actually the Vatacom forecast was better. At that time, when I was making this forecast, when I was taking this data, it looks like, well, Vatacom thinks that during the day, it will be cold, cooler than Vata Online thinks will be during the night. Okay, I spent too much time um, planning forecast for the next two weeks, so let's plan today. It's already pretty late, kids will wake up, and I should perform something with them. So let's check the, the, the weather for today. Oh doesn't look that nice uh, in the morning, so during the day it's also not that fascinating, and even in the evening it doesn't look so nice, although this picture is pretty cool, right? We see we have all the weathers in one picture. We have sun, we have rain, we have cloud, and we have a lightning over there, <laughs> right? It's a perfect prediction for us, but we, can, <laughs> but we can look out of the window and yeah, it's raining there, so we should stay at home, and what we can do with the kids, we play some table games, right? We love playing table games, we love playing board games, and we have a lot of them. And while you're playing with the kids, you realize that some of them, they are very interesting. Kids love playing them more and more and more and more, and some they are not that fascinating. And this is the question I raised to myself when I was playing several games with my kids. So first game we took is the Asta Obstgarten, the first garden. I see some of you know this game. So the rules are very, very simple. You have a dice, you have four trees with different colors. You're just throwing a dice, and if you have the color of some fruit, you're just picking up this fruit. And if you have the crow, then the crow is making step forward into the garden, right? Pure gambling. The kid's making no decision in this case. They're throwing a dice and making those steps. And second thing is it's just a team game. I cannot win against my son, he cannot win against me. We as a team winning against the crow or vice versa. And we are both happy when we win and we are both sad when we don't. Second thing is that actually the winning probability against the crow is almost 80%. It means in most cases we are winning against the crow rather than losing. 
And another step, the game is pretty short. We're doing just 22 steps on average to finish the game. Right? Imagine you're just two seconds for a throw, within a minute you're done. And this average makes sense because the distribution is very nicely symmetric. We have this pick in the middle. We have maximally 40 steps, minimally five steps. Then we took another game, Rette de Lufte, The Planes 2. It's a game in which you're somehow generating random numbers between one and six by throwing a dice with this fancy machine standing over there. And your feature is making step forward or jumping over some fields or jumping over some fields backwards. Right? Again, pure gambling, no decision. You just throw a dice and you check out on which field you should land. And it's not a team game, right? Because I'm playing against my son or he, or he is playing against me. So the winning probability in this case is one over the number of players. It means if you're playing two of us, the winning probability is 50%. If the whole family is playing, then actually in this case is 25%, which is much, much lower if you take the case of the Erste Obstgarten. Right? And the game is a little bit longer. You should take 40 steps on average to finish it. Right? You think and throw and throw the dice. Even moreover, this average is meaningless in this case because the distribution is highly skewed. It means you can throw up to 200 times in order to finish a game. Right? 10, 15 minutes sitting and throwing your dice. Okay, it's time for a midday sleep. I'm bringing my kids to bed and then we should perform something with my wife. Let's check out out the window. What's the weather outside? <clears throat> It's raining, right? So the weather forecast at this point was pretty okay, so we decided to watch some movies. There are a lot of them, right? Different genres, different types, different lengths. And we wanted to watch something, and my wife told me, a friend of mine told me that the very nice movie we should watch should be The Twilight. <laughs> the the Breaking Dawn Part 1. I said, well, but none of my friends said nothing about this film. <laughs> Then we decided, okay, let's check out on the IMDb what's the rating there. It's a beautiful website on which you check the information about all the films, about the director, about the crew, etc. So it's 4.9, it's not that high, but it's okay, you can watch this. But we are statisticians, both of us. Let's check out what's the population of voters telling about this film, right? And we see it's, you have two picks at one, at a 10. We're telling us it's 15% telling the movie is not that good, 15% telling the movie is gorgeous, and we have some bump in the middle. But that's not what's interesting me, me interesting them what the boys are singing about the film in my age category, right? So that's what I did here. All right, so we have a pick around 25% of boys thinking that the movie is not really worth watching, and then it starts declining. But if you check out for the female and the age generation of my wife, it looks slightly <laughs> different, right? So it makes me, I mean, it gives us already some suspicion, thinking that maybe there is some dependency between the gender and the rating, right? So what we did, you split up the ratings into two groups. Bad, the rating from one to five, good from six to 10. Then you construct the so-called contingency table, and which allows us to compute the correlation coefficient. If it's closer to one, there exists the perfect dependency. If it's closer to zero, there is an independency between two variables, in this case, rating and the gender. If you compute it for this case, you obtain 0 0.47, which will tell us that there is a moderate dependency between the gender and the rating, and we can conclude that this is rather the ladies' movie. So I say, um, bad or not. So uh, boys, after football, told me that the pretty cool movie to watch would be The Middleman from 2009. Right? And my wife immediately said, OK, I made the same, the same investigation as you did. So we immediately went to the IMDb. The rating is a little bit higher. It's 6.6. .6. We immediately afterwards look what the, public, what the other people are telling about this film. So it's more symmetric. There is a bump in the middle. We also have at point two some higher ratings. And she immediately said, I would like to check out what the boys of your age generation are thinking about it film. It looks like this. It's not gorgeous. It's not a wonderful movie, but it's okay, right? It's rating seven, so it's a good film worth watching, although there is some slight bump on the rating of two. But then she decided, let's check out what girls thinking about this film, and it looks like this. Right, so we have a high peak at the rating of two. We then made also the idea that actually there should be some dependency between the rating and the gender. So we constructed again the contingency table, and the correlation coefficient was 
0.52, which indicating us that it actually is a dependency between the gender and the rating, and we can conclude there is a rather man movie. And I actually strongly believe that those two movies are the most female movie in the IMDb database and the most man movie in the IMDb database. So then we should come somehow to the consensus, right? So we decided to watch It's a Wonderful Life by Frank Capra, and, you know, it has the high ranking for 8.6. It belongs to the IMDb, top 250. And if you look at the, uh, at the votings, you see they are very close to each other for men as well as for women. And if the movie is good, there shouldn't be any dependency for gender. And if you do the same study as we did before, we have realized that there is no dependency between the ratings and the gender, so we can call it movie for all. So, kids slept well. Let's check out what's the weather outside. Oh, it's sunny. Right again, the weather forecast was okay. At first it said it should be rainy, then we have sunny day. So then we played outside near Elba, played different games, and then we need to read some books. Right, we also have a variety of them. You can read, you can choose from. And my famous writer is the genius of John Ronald Rell Tolkien. Right? who created for us the world of Middle-earth, who wrote for us The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings. You definitely know the writer. You definitely saw the movies. Uh, I like, I read all of them. I enjoyed reading them. And then recently, I found three more books. Also written is by John Ronald Rell Tolkien, Silmarillion, The Children of Hurin, and Unfinished Tales of Middle-earth. And actually, the children of Hurin have been published in 2007, right? John Tolkien died in 1973, and, and children of Hurin published in 2007. Then, little written there, it has been edited by Christopher Tolkien. I read the books. They're very nice, but they are different, right? You feel that they are not like the books by John Tolkien. They're not worse. They're not better. They're just somehow different. Then I have realized that actually John Tolkien left a lot of notes afterwards, after his death, where Christopher Tolkien brought them together, filled all the gaps, made the story very smooth. But what statistics said about it? What did it? I pick up all the books, nine books by Tolkien, three books by the Christopher Tolkien, and the compu computed the table, 12 books, 12 columns, and I can get out 250 most frequently used words in all 12 books. Okay, very simple words. I removed all own words like dwarves, hobbit, Gandalf, Aragorn, just simple words like set, will, be, take, took, etc., etc. Simple words. And then plug it into the cluster analysis. Simple technique that we learn with our master students. So, cluster analysis is producing us the tree, which we call the dendrogram. The closer our books together in this tree, the more related they are. So, at first step, we realize that all the Lord of the Rings coming together. Then we have the Hobbit over there. Then the rest of the books by the John Ronald Rell Tolkien. And in the end, three books edited by Christopher Tolkien coming into play. So what I wanted to say with this speech is actually the kids can fill statistics, right, with the games. They know what's good, what's bad. We have a feeling of the statistics. There is a statistician living inside of all of us. And actually, statistics is everywhere. Thanks a lot.